It's the first Sunday after Christmas, like you didn't know that. I'm excited again to have all of my people in one place. Both New Berlin and Morris are at Morris, and you people on YouTube are joining us. Thank you for agreeing to join together today. I greet you this morning with these lines from our psalm, Psalm 148. Young men and women alike, old and young together, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. This morning, our call to worship is going to be in two parts. There'll be some speaking, and then there'll be some singing from the song, Like a Child. We have celebrated the birth of Jesus, but how shall we know him when he comes? How shall we greet and respond to the promised one? Will Jesus come to us as a prince or a pauper? Will we see him in those of greatest need? Lord, make us truly ready to receive the gift of Jesus, your beloved Son. Open our hearts to the good news Jesus brings to us. going to sing some of the Christmas songs we've not sung yet so far this year. Our first hymn this morning, Away in a Manger.
Pray with me, please. God of holy mystery, it was no heavenly stranger that came to save us. It was no happy accident that freed us from captivity. It was no careless gesture that showed us the ways of life and death. You are our light and our salvation. You alone are worthy of our worship and praise. In this season of Christmas, remind us once more of what you offer, a love born of endless searching, a connection born of deep longing, a future born of selfless sacrifice. Be with us now, O gift of heaven, for we are your people and you are our God. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson comes from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 2, verses 18 through 20 and 26. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. His mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord repay you with children by this woman for the gift that she made to the Lord. And then they would return to their home. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and with the people. Our epistle lesson is from the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Our next hymn this morning is That Boy Child of Mary. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was twelve years old, 
they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Good morning. Planning is something I'm pretty okay with when I can plan one thing at a time. But the weeks before Christmas had my planning mode in overdrive. I was planning Sunday services, Advent liturgies, things at home and with cousins and family, and I was planning this special service today. I thought when I first mentioned it that we would have lessons in carol service on this Sunday, but then I planned for extra singing on Christmas Eve. I love to hear whole congregations sing Christmas music. So then I sort of plan to use your stories of gifts of love on Love Sunday. I wrote the message and everything, and then it didn't feel right. And then in my effort to get this planning under control, I read the lectionary for today and things fell into place. Well, first they fell apart. Who ever heard of the Sunday after Christmas being the week we read about the 12-year-old Jesus. What happened to the baby, the wise men, the flight to Egypt? I sort of planned on that, but brace yourselves. The lectionary is finished with Christmas. That is why we had the Magi on Christmas Eve. I couldn't leave them wondering about the star over Bethlehem. I needed closure. And so today we talk about gifts because Jesus was a gift for all of humankind. Hear again the words of 1 Samuel chapter 2. This is about Hannah. Remember her? We read about her weeks ago, how she wanted a baby and wasn't able to have one. And Eli, the priest and the prophet who sat near the door of the temple, saw her praying for a son and mistook her for a drunken floozy. <laughs> he told her to get sober and stop sinning. And she told him she was praying for a son, one that if she had, she would give back to service in the temple. Well... She did have a son, Samuel, all that waiting. And then out of love for God who granted her a son, she did it. She gave him to the temple. And every year she made him a little robe that he could wear when he was ministering to Eli in the temple. Every year she gave Samuel one a bit bigger than the one last year. Eli understood Hannah a lot better by the time the robes kept arriving. And he said, May the Lord repay you with children for the gift you made to the Lord. So many of you shared stories of the gifts that meant the most to you. No one shared that someone gave them a linen robe or even an ephod. <laughs> Mike Virgil did share that he thinks the gifts he treasured the most were his daughters. Hannah felt the same way, no doubt. I think most of us could have said that. Our children are so special and our grandchildren. But I want to share with you today the stories that were shared with me, and I will hook them up a bit with verses in the Bible, not necessarily ones from today's lectionary. I've used stories from both of my churches, so for our friends who view our services on YouTube, you will have to think about your greatest gift and match your story into a category that I am sharing. Some gifts are sacrificial. Not as sacrificial as God's plan for his son, not like Abraham and Isaac, but still ones that required someone to do something not quite as easy as putting the credit card in a reader and going home with something. Many of us are willing to make sacrifices for the ones we love. Here are a couple of stories like that. Bob Brunel's dad sacrificed time in order to get Bob a bicycle. 
During the war, bikes were not to be found. Manufacturing plants that had made bicycles were making items necessary for the war. But in 1947, Bob said, father saw an advertisement in the newspaper that Macy's had received a, little mi a limited shipment of post-war Columbia bikes. So he went early and waited in line for Bob's very first bicycle. It was my greatest Christmas present, he said, and I treasure it to this day. Another sacrifice of time is displayed in this next shared story. Becky's mom made her a ceramic lamp. The lamp was of Becky Thatcher, you know, Tom Sawyer's girlfriend. Becky had it all the while growing up from age eight or nine, but then it finally got put away. And years later, she took it out of storage, but it no longer worked. Her husband, Ted, and her mom and dad worked on it to get it working again, and she was given it for Christmas a second time, a gift of time and sacrifice. We think of the gifts of time and sacrifice that we watched Jesus give. When he was on his way to some place to also teach others, he was stopped along the way and asked, would you heal my servant? Or would you come, my daughter's very ill. Often he was trying to have time with his disciples and the people just kept coming and coming to hear what he had to say. He made room, he made time, even one time getting in a boat so that there would be room for him in the crowd a gift of time, which was sometimes a sacrifice. Sometimes it's just a gift of time spent together. Janine and Paul have been married 50 years. That's a lot of time, but in that time, they have raised three daughters who all have their own families. And that busy combination makes time together really hard to get, but precious to have. Janine related this. Our children gave us a vacation in July to spend with them celebrating our 50th anniversary. To me, the greatest gift is time together making memories. These memories are a treasure for us now and years from now for our children and grandchildren to hold close. Think of a gift of time the disciples had with Jesus, times around the table while traveling from town to town in lonely far off places for praying. Think of the stories that Jesus shared during those times they were together gift of time. Think of the lessons that Jesus took the time to share with them, parables and reminders and examples. Time. Then there are the gifts that fill a space in someone's heart that probably could have been left unfilled, but then surprisingly the space was filled. Sometimes when the person didn't even know the space was there, like a husband on his only day off, showing up unexpectedly to spend time with his wife, even when she totally understands what his limited free time means. Or the perfect gift of a trip to the Masters Tournament planned from overseas so Charlotte would have this gift with her grandson, Tyler. She never dreamed of going to the Masters, but what a gift. Or an easy bake oven that Angela Hillis got from her parents when she was in her 30s because she wanted one when she was a kid and never got it. But then surprise, that's a gift that keeps on giving. Not only could Angela bake a cake with a light bulb, so could her daughter, Alexa. Or like majorette boots, same kind of story, given to me when I clearly have nowhere to march in them. But since I didn't get them in fifth grade when they were the thing I wanted the most, Ray gave them to me a few years ago. This surprising kind of gift isn't unknown to Jesus. When Jesus, after supper, put a towel around his waist and washed each of the disciples' feet, it was a huge surprise and a huge lesson. The disciples were beginning to understand the message Jesus had been teaching them for the three years he was with them, but then there was this unexpected gift of this surprising action. It drove home the lesson, the least will be greatest, the last will be first. Be a servant to others, a surprising gift from Jesus. Sometimes the gift we give or get is done in words, precious words, like Shirley's granddaughter's essay about her grandma, Nowhere does it say grandma tells me all the time she loves me. It was just clear to Katie how grandma feels and this letter in little girl handwriting has been on Shirley's refrigerator for years and years. Katie's now 29. Those words are a gift. Kathy Codrich learned how to knit and crochet from her grandmother. Surely there were words that helped with the teaching. And then Kathy related the rest of the story. One day grandma asked me if I would like to go shopping with her. Of course. And off they went to J.J. Newberry's, where Kathy was allowed to pick out a skein of yarn and she bought a pair of knitting needles her grandmother did. 
When she got back home, Grandma showed me the basics and off I went to make a scarf. I showed her my work and she promptly ripped it out as if it, because it was a mess and she told me to try again. So I did, several times, until she deemed it passable. The needles were a great gift and she taught me the value of a job well done and one to be proud of. Surely with the ripping and the tearing of the scarf, there were words that hammered home the lesson of doing a good job. In both cases, there was, there was love in the words. Katie's love for Shirley, Kathy's love for her grandma's patience and teaching, grandma's love in teaching Kathy about good work, love illustrated. Sometimes the gift is the start of something and becomes more precious as time goes on. Pat said when Russ and she were beginning to date in high school, he bought her a necklace featuring a tiny gold heart with a real diamond chip. He saved the money from his delivery job. But apparently Russ was shy about romantic things in those days. Pat lived on the second floor of a two-family home. He rang the bell, put the gift on the bottom of the stairs, and ran away. Pat treasures it as the gift, the first gift that he ever gave her. Think of the many people who heard about Jesus but didn't know how to approach him. They might have shouted out, Jesus, son of David, have pity. They might have climbed a tree for a better look. They might have snuck up behind to touch his robe. But in the end, the gift of Jesus' love was huge, and it was the start of many people's lifelong love of him and his way. Sometimes the gifts come from or for people no longer with us, but the gift continues to fill spaces in our hearts. Joan's mom asked her in 1966 what she would like for Christmas, and Joan showed her a nativity set in the Montgomery Ward catalog. Her mom got it for her. It's part of the Christmas decorations in the Miller house each year. Joan said, every time I unpack it, I remember my mother and how she was always thinking about others. I treasure the gift of love from her heart, Joan said. Pat Hilgert's son, Greg, made collages for her and his sister after Pat's husband, their dad, passed away. Pat says he found a picture of us when we were young, dried the flowers, and included what was on the back of Jeff's funeral card, Jeff's own thoughts, and a quote he liked. These treasured gifts fill the space that needed filling. Thinking about Jesus again, when the four friends lowered the man on the mat through the roof, Jesus told the man his sins were forgiven. When Jesus was called out on that, only God can forgive sins, the Pharisees said. Jesus said, take up your mat and walk. And the man did. All the while, his friends peered down through the hole in the roof. It is a gift to have sins forgiven. And then adding more to the evidence as Jesus as God's son, Jesus adds action. And Jesus filled the space of both forgiveness and physical healing. Spaces that are filled because of love. One expected, perhaps, and one not. And then sometimes the gift just reminds us of the people we love, like Joan's nativity set reminds her of her mom. Linda's sparkling necklace that came from a beloved friend reminds Linda of Bonnie's sparkle and liveliness. Christmas is about Christ's birth, but it's also about gifts. And if gifts are about love, so many times we talk about how the world would be better a place if, surely, if we loved like Christmas all the time, what a light there would be in the darkness for, for so many. Think about the past month. Each week I offered in the third part of each message things to do to add light to our own lives and to others' lives. If we have done as was suggested, we also have read more of our Bible, which leads us to think about doing life and love a bit better. We've given, we've been thankful, we've reevaluated our activities to make time for ourselves. We've sought peace and joy and hope in Christ. Loving and living like Christmas all year surely wouldn't be a bad thing. Thank you, church, for sharing your stories. Your stories are wonderful, and sharing them gave me such a vision of how wonderful life is. Christ came so that we could have life and have it abundantly. Most of us feel that way at this time of year, that and tired and full of Christmas goodies and ready for the maid to come in and pack everything back up into boxes and take it into the attic. But still, the gift of the Christ child is the greatest gift of all. And when days feel as if we are done, just plain done, Remember that he is with us. He came for us, and he will again come again for us. And all of that, 
All of that is also a gift to us, the children of God. Let it be so. Let us pray. Jesus, humble King, we remember that your family had nowhere to stay when you were born. You were born in a stable and you were placed in a manger. We, Lord, have homes and jobs and loved ones near. We sometimes are not humble because we feel so blessed. Remind us that we are of the privileged people. Please be with the homeless, the refugees, and those who are struggling to make ends meet this Christmas. Jesus, King of Kings, we remember that powerful leaders visited you when you were born. Those men traveled many miles to praise you and worship you. Lord, we have only to hop in a car and travel a few minutes. Remind us often of the benefits of our lives here in this place. Remind us also to be thankful for the leaders who work for us, care for us, and continue to try to make the people of the world happy. It's not an easy job, Lord. Give your wisdom, boldness, and grace to our world leaders, to politicians, business people, and those with influence. Jesus, King of Peace, we remember Herod's jealousy, lies, and violence when you were born. People today are jealous. They lie, and violence greets us every day when we turn on the television. Bring your peace in places of conflict, anger, and hatred across the world and right here in our communities, even in our very homes. Jesus, our brother, we pray now the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
Our final hymn this morning is Angels We Have Heard on High. Angels we have heard on high Sweetly singing o'er the plains And the mountains in reply Echoing their joyous strains Gloria In excelsis Deo Gloria In excelsis Deo Why this jubilee? Why your joyous strains prolong? What the gladsome tidings be Which inspire your heavenly song? Gloria In excelsis day the Lord, the newborn King. Gloria in excelsis Dei. And now this benediction. May the transforming acceptance of Mary and Joseph, the imagination of the shepherds, and the persistence of the wise men guide us as we seek the truth, always moving toward the divine promise, always aware God can be hidden in the frailest among us, always open to the unexpected flash of grace, to the showing forth of that love that embraces us all. Go in peace with a heart full of the gift of the Christmas child. Amen. Our postlude this morning is verse 1 of Joy to the World. Joy to the world.